All right. So our first speaker is going to speak to us today about interventional pulmonology. I would like to welcome Dr. Gatine Michaud, who is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and also the director of the Thoracic Medical Oncology Program here at Perlmutter Cancer Center. I'm actually not the director of medical oncology. I'm actually the, uh, I am the uh, chief of interventional pulmonary and the director of the lung cancer and early detection program uh, here at NYU. And I'm a pulmonary physician and not a medical oncologist. This is actually my team. So we actually have a very large team here at NYU, larger than any other uh, place in the Northeast and certainly the largest one in New York City. Uh, I am the chief and then I have Jamie Besick, Louise Angel, Dan Sturman, and Simon Rafek who are my other co-attendings. Um, today, I want to talk about all the many roles that we play as pulmonary doctors within a multidisciplinary lung uh, cancer management team. So believe it or not, this is actually the subject of even um, big widespread discussions amongst the American Thoracic Society, the American Lung Association, and the, uh, and the European Respiratory Society. They've actually had guidelines to talk about what pulmonary doctors should be doing as part of the care of patients with lung cancer. Um, we have all of these roles that we play. We start out here with lung cancer screening really early. We do early detection. We do risk factor modification. We talk to patients about smoking cessation. And risk factor modification has a lot to do with not just smoking, but also the other risk factors that can actually lead to lung cancers. Um, environmental things, um, uh, also talking about things like uh, managing, managing your, your, cardio uh, your COPD, uh, emphysema. Uh, we do a lot of diagnostics, staging of cancers, restaging of cancers after initial therapy. We do symptom management and palliation. Um, we do risk, stratif uh, risk stratification. So if you're looking at going on for surgery and you have underlying pulmonary disease that has sort of actually contributed to your diagnosis, we actually help the thoracic surgeons by helping them understand how much lung you can afford to actually have removed. So that's what this risk stratification means. Endobronchial therapies, so lung cancer treatments that are done via the airways. Um, and we are a very high tech group and we're gonna talk about some of that. Um, we actually can go through the airways to get out to tumors that are within the lung tissue itself. And we have a lot of interesting technologies, things like microwave, and we have technologies like GPS, like in your car, and we'll talk about some of that as well. Uh, we actually contribute a lot to the ongoing care and the treatment plans for patients that are getting uh, treatments, such as immune therapies. So we ac acquire tissue to help guide treatment. Um, same thing with we... Um, also help with the management, the pulmonary management of patients that have um, complications due to their treatment, but the lung, uh, particularly lung complications. So you can see that we actually wear a lot of hats. And by the way, this crazy person here is me. Um, when we talk about the risk factors, certainly the things that, that we think about, and the reason these, some of these are highlighted, are these are the things that I see in my practice every day as a pulmonolo pulmonologist. So certainly we know that smoking is a risk factor. It depends on when you smoked, how long you smoked, et cetera. COPD, we used to think that emphysema, chronic bronchitis and emphysema was related, to the, so the risk was actually related to the cigarettes. But what we know now is that it's actually an independent risk factor. So no matter how much you smoke, if you have emphysema, it actually increases the risk slightly as well. The one thing that's not on here is gender, and we know that women are actually at higher risk of developing lung cancers and also emphysema. So generally we say for every cigarette you smoke, you're three times more likely to develop lung cancer and emphysema than you are if you're a man. So, and, and there's actually impacts on, on treatment from gender. So I think that those are something else that we actually see a lot in our clinic. Asbestos-related uh, exposures. Um, this is IPF. IPF is actually fibrotic lung disease, so when your lung scars. Um, some of that can be congenital, so meaning that, that it actually comes in families. And then immune suppression. So we know that, the, that lung scar and immune suppression can also lead to malignancy. So there's a lot of medications that you can have taken for other types of diseases that can actually lead to lung cancers. So those are the things that we see in our, in our clinic. When we think about lung cancer screening, there's lung cancer screening. Um, 
is actually pretty new in, in the sense that people have been trying to figure out a good way to screen and catch lung cancers early for the better part of the last 20 years. Over the last five years, we've actually had a trial that came out that actually shows that lung cancer screening actually really does work as long as you do it the right way. We need to really pick high-risk patients. So there, the study that, we, that came out was 54,000 patients over five years. Um, they, they selected patients that were 55 to 77 that had no symptoms to suggest that they actually had a cancer or had an underlying diagnosis to start with. They had to smoke a pack a day of cigarettes for more than 30 years, and they had to either still be smoking or have quit within 15 years. Um, with some of the other things is that these people all benefited from sitting down and having a conversation with them, talking about their risk factors, talking about what their risks actually were. We also talked to these people about stopping smoking, and we also had this thing about compliance counseling, which means that if we find something, what are we going to do about it? Are you willing to go down that pathway of, of looking and trying to figure out the, the way to manage this? So, oops, uh, part of my slide is missing. Okay, well, half of my slide is not here, and I'm not sure why that is, so uh, we'll just talk about this. So essentially, what this big study showed is that um, when you looked over a 10-year period, the risk, the, the benefit from, from actually getting a CT scan once a year for three consecutive years in these high-risk people would range anywhere from 2 to 20%. Overall, what it was is they showed that if you got this regular CT scan for three years, what happened was you were actually had a reduction in your lung cancer death rate of about 20 uh, of 20 percent overall, and that range kind of ranged from two to 20 percent depending on how many risk factors. So the people that had smoked more for more years and were still smoking and were older actually had the highest uh, had the most benefit. But what it showed is that is that certainly um, there is definite benefit from doing this. One thing that people are routinely have in their, in their GP's offices is they get these chest x-rays every year. The truth is, is that the resolution of a chest x-ray is so poor that you have to have a really big thing in your lung before you catch it. So chest x-rays aren't good enough. That's why the CT scan, this was the first time, and what the study did is they, they split patients in half, kind of randomly, and said, Half of the patients are going to get a chest x-ray every year, and the other half are going to get CT scans. And so the patients that got CT scans every year, and if they found something, they followed it and were more aggressive and actually went down a pathway to try and diagnose things, those people actually were the ones that got the benefit. The people that got the chest x-rays had no benefit. So, and these are some of the things that we think about when we're actually thinking about, you know, who's going to benefit and why, and what should we, what, what should the conversation, if somebody's thinking about having a CT scan um, for screening, what are the things that they should be thinking about? And the big benefits are, of course, this 20% reduction in, in death from lung cancer. That's a really big thing. But you need to remember also that, that the only way the lung has to actually say that it's been injured is to actually form a little scar. So if you get a pneumonia, if you have a lung injury of any sort, it's going to scar. And, and it's very difficult to determine what is a scar and what is actually a small evolving cancer. So, you know, there's a lot of times that these things are really small. We have to sit back and we have to watch them for a little while. And that can be very anxiety provoking. The other thing to know is that is that sometimes we have to do additional tests. Every test that we do comes with a risk. You know, is, there, is the lung going to collapse? Are you going to have a complication from it? So we don't take these things lightly. And we also recognize the fact that you're going to get radiation with these CT scans. And so we need to factor that in as well. So having that balanced discussion, sitting down and talking about, are you really at high risk? And if you're really at high risk, is it worth the, if, is it worth the risk of having the CT scan to actually go down that pathway? The other thing that we do a lot of is manage nodules. So, you know, we find a lot of nodules with these, with these CT scans. And we also find them because you go to hospital for some other reason, you have chest pain, whatever. Somebody does a CT scan for another reason, and we haphazardly find these nodules. And so one of our tricks is trying to figure out which ones are cancers and take them all out. But we don't want to take out any lung that actually doesn't have a cancer in it. So we have to always be weighing this back and forth and trying to figure out who actually has a high likelihood of having a cancer and who does not. And I think that that's one of the things that my group does really well. We have a lot of experience dealing with nodules, and we have a lot of experience dealing with pulmonary patients, and we stop and we think about it, and we weigh the risks and the benefits, and we kind of try and advise our patients regarding what our next steps should be. So... You know, one of the things that, that the, the uh, American College of Chest Physicians actually came up with a little while ago was a, was a recommendation with respect to nodules. And what we know is that, is that 
there is a lot of discussion that needs to be had with patients to talk about the decision of what to do once you find a nodule. Because not all nodules are going to be cancer. Some of them are going to be benign. And when is, when is it the right decision to take a nodule out? Or when is it the right decision to, uh, to take it out directly? When is it the right decision to watch it on an x-ray? And when is the right decision to put a needle in it and try and biopsy it? And a lot of that has to do with you and, and your ability to tolerate waiting and watching. And I think that that's where the skill comes in, is having that discussion, an open discussion with our patients about, you know, what is your tolerance? What is your preference? And what risks are you willing to take on? There's a lot of ways to get to lung nodules. This is one way. This is called endobronchial ultrasound. So essentially what we do is we go into the windpipe with, with a scope, a telescope, this is a flexible telescope. We put a little probe through that telescope that has an ultrasound probe on it, and I think probably many of you have had an ultrasound at some point. But this is actually a, an ultrasound of this thing right here. And what we do is we put our probe out, and we can see right here, we can see that area. And what this allows us to do is make sure that we're in the nodule that we're looking for before we take the biopsy. This is, this is the roadmap. This is this is basically GPS of the lung. There's something called electromagnetic navigation. Electromagnetic navigation is, we say, we look at your CAT scan, and we say, X marks the spot. This is the nodule we want to get to. And just like with the GPS of your car, as we're going through the airways with that telescope, the, the computer says to us, turn left, turn right, go up, go down, go left, go right. And it gives us a map out to a, an area. And then we put that little ultrasound probe in through our little working channel in, into our guide, and we check to make sure that we're in it, and then we take our biopsies. You know, if we're going to take biopsies, there's always a risk that the lung could collapse down, there could be bleeding, there could be things that could happen. So we really want to make sure that before we do any of those things, that, and we take any, uh, take any risks with our patients, that we're really where we think we are. And so all of this technology has really increased our ability to get through things, even pretty small things. What we know is that if you do just things blindly and just take blind biopsies, the yield isn't very good. So traditionally, before all this technology came out, we would actually put a scope down there. We would just randomly take biopsies and, you know, a bit throw caution to the wind because we didn't have good technologies. But it, over the last 10 years, the, to the technology has really gotten quite good. And what we know is if we take a lot of these technologies in combination, we're really able to get pr to become very, very accurate. This is one of the things that we do here at NYU, and actually it's kind of funny that Dr. Cerfolio happened to walk into the room just as I put this slide up. Um, Dr. Cerfolio is the chief of thoracic surgery here, and, and he and I do these, tech, these uh, procedures together. So this is a technique where what we do is we find the nodule that we're looking for, we go out using that technology, that GPS technology, to the nodule, and then instead of taking a biopsy, what we do is we put dye into it and we tattoo the lung, and that dye leaches out to the surface of the lung, and when the surgeon goes into your chest to try and find that nodule, they see this nice bright beacon. So they see this bright green light, and it allows them to actually take out as minimal amount of lung as they possibly can. And this is actually also increases, the, it makes it a lot quicker, it makes it a lot easier for the surgeon, and it actually reduces your risk. When we think about about lung cancers, even at the beginning of a lung cancer, when patients first present with a lung cancer, a lot of cancers are actually, the horse is a bit out of the barn. The, the thing is, is that you have two lungs, you have a lot of surface area, so it takes a lot in the lung. The lung can take a lot of, a lot of um, injury before it really manifests, before you start to cough, before you cough up blood, before you have chest pain, before you have any symptoms whatsoever. And so a lot of lung cancers, because they're silent uh, until they're a little bit further stage, they present really late. And that's why lung cancer screening works. So one of the things that you need to have up front, or a lot of patients need to have up front, is a staging pr procedure. And these are some of the staging procedures that you can have. You can have something called a mediastinoscopy, where they go underneath the breastbone, make a small incision in your neck, go under the breastbone, with a camera and take biopsies of those lymph nodes. This is called endobronchial ultrasound. This is something that I do. This is done by a thoracic surgeon. This is actually a technique that I do where it's a little telescope that goes through the airways. It has an integrated ultrasound. So this little thing down here is an ultrasound probe and it looks through the wall of the windpipe and allows us to see the lymph glands because lung cancers like to grow in their site 
They like to actually get into the lymph system, into the drainage system, and they also get, like to get into the blood system and then go to other parts of the body. So oftentimes we'll get a PET scan to look for other parts of the body. We will do this technique or one of these techniques to actually look at those lymph glands, and then we'll have a CT scan and a PET scan to actually look at that, that, that local site. This technique is actually really minimally invasive. We can do it all with a needle. Um, you know, you're at the hospital for a total of three hours. The procedure takes about 45 minutes. We can see the lymph glands that are sitting around the airways and we can sample them directly while watching a TV screen. And so we know where we are. It really minimizes the risk. You, chances are you're gonna cough up a little tiny bit of blood after the procedure, that's normal because it has to come up and out. Patients will have, sometimes have a bit of a fever afterwards, so that's just a bit of inflammation and you're all fine by the next day. And so it's a, a really good procedure. Now, sometimes we combine that with this, which is called EUS, which goes through your esophagus as opposed to your windpipe, so your swallowing tube as opposed to your breathing tube. And in combination, really, those two procedures can actually hit pretty much everything that's around the airways. And we do a lot of procedures in combination with our, our colleagues in gastroenterology here. And so this is what you see. This is the combo deal right here. And what we know is that's, that's probably the best option. As pulmonary doctors, we also do a lot of palliations. So we actually help, help our colleagues in medical oncology, radiation oncology, and thoracic surgery manage symptoms. You know, one of our big goals is to actually improve patients' quality of life from shortness of breath that's poorly managed or bleeding from the airways or coughing. And so we do a lot of that. And I actually see one of the people who I have done a procedure on sitting and shaking their head in the front row, which is kind of nice. One of the things that, that I find really interesting is that um, one of the things as pulmonary doctors is we well recognize the fact that, that, um, that patients often will have a lot of reasons to be short of breath. And for us as pulmonary doctors, we actually are very used to treating emphysema, blood clots in the lung, um, asthma. We can treat all the many pulmonary things. And one of the things that we realize is that a lot of the risk factors overlap. And so we spend a lot of time managing all the things that can happen in lungs that aren't related to the cancer as well. And before we're going to go down a pathway of trying to treat a, treat a lesion or treat something in the lung, so whether it's we're going to try and treat coughing or shortness of breath because of a, a fluid collection around the lung or something in the airway, we want to make sure that all those really easy things, the treating of the asthma, the treating of the blood clot, all of that has been taken care of. So this is an old, old, old slide that one of my one of my mentors gave me, and I really like it. So, which is that we make sure that every single thing that can be treated that could be contributing to shortness of breath that's pretty easy to treat is treated before we go down something that, where we're gonna have to intervene on your airways or your, your space around your lung. This is a tunnel pleural catheter. This is something that we do a lot of here at NYU. This is for when you have fluid that accumulates around the lung. So oftentimes what happens is, and I, I like to say that the lining of the lung, so there's a lining on the chest wall and there's a lining on the lung, and there's a space between them. And everybody has a little bit of fluid in there, and that's so that it's a bit of lubricant so the lung can slide in the chest. Sometimes when the lining is injured, more fluid builds up and the sump pump doesn't work very well. And so the fluid accumulates and the lung gets pushed down from the outside. And that can make people pretty breathless. It can also cause you to have pain. It can cause you to actually um, not be able to sleep at night. It can reduce your appetite. It can do a lot of things. So one of the ways of doing that, of, of managing that, is to oftentimes we'll, we'll just put a little needle in the chest and siphon off the fluid. If the fluid comes back, sometimes we need to do something that's longer lasting until your treatment has time to have effect. And so what we do is we put these little catheters under the skin to reduce the risk of infection. So you can see this right here. It goes underneath the skin and into your chest. And we actually siphon off that fluid several times a week to keep that lung inflated and keep you breathing better. And this is actually, this takes 15 minutes. We do it in an operating room. It's really, it's really an easy procedure. This is something called boracoscopy, where we put a little camera into that space. This is actually a very useful procedure when we actually need pieces of the lining to help guide treatment. And we often will do these two procedures, the putting the catheter in and this biopsy of the lining together um, when we need tissue and we need to try and manage the fluid longer term. Um, some of the other things that we do is we take tumors out of airways with a laser. Um, so we often will have tumor that is actually inside the airway. This is your windpipe or a drawing of your windpipe. This is tumor within the airway. What we like to do is if, if it's causing either blockage or bleeding, patients don't tolerate that very well. I mean, the last thing you want is to not feel like you can get a good breath in or be coughing up blood. And so what we do is we go in and we actually burn the tissue. And the reason we burn the tissue is so that it doesn't bleed anymore. And then we can take this, this tissue off the wall 
and we can burn the base so that it doesn't bleed anymore. And that actually, it's surprising because uniformly when we do this, patients come in and they're feeling really poorly. And when we take them to the recovery room after they're all done, they go, oh, look what I can do, and they take a big breath in. And it's quite amazing to see what a big difference this can make. And so um, anyway, I think my time is pretty much up, but the things I want to talk about now before I go are that about a third patients will actually come in with obstructions of their airway, so blockages in their airway. And we can certainly improve people's quality of life when that happens. 50% of patients with lung cancers can develop fluid around their lungs. And, and by managing that, we can again really improve people's quality of life. Both tunnel pleural catheters and pleuroscopy or, or thoracoscopy in sealing up that space can really improve patient symptoms. Um, and if we need tissue, we really want to put that little camera in there to be able to take some biopsies. Um, and again, you know, I think that one of the biggest take-home messages for me is we just have so much more to learn, and I'm really thankful for all of the innovations that have actually happened over the last 10 years because I think it's really changed how we manage patients. And I wish to thank you for your time.